So welcome everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center at CUNY. My name is Frank Henschmann, I'm the director of the Siegel Center. And uh, this is a, a wonderful evening, also a bit melancholic one. It's the last of our season. We had truly an outstanding one. It started with Prelude and we had presentations from China, Argentina, uh, about uh, choreography of uh, African-American uh, uh, choreographers and diaspora and many, many others as you see in our brochure. And it's always good to have a good beginning and a good ending of whatever you do, even in theater. So sometimes you get away with stuff in between. You keep it a bit mysterious, but um, this has to be good. And tonight, uh, I think, is one of the great evenings also of this season. We have, again, uh, with us here our great Italian um, Playwrights Project that also won a big award. Maybe Valeria will say a little bit. She came here to New York on her own and had this idea to really reestablish communication, a bridge, uh, between two countries that are big theater countries, but it had been a little bit, uh, uh, as I would say, in the sailing there was no wind. And the ship didn't advance, and if at all, the wind came from the wrong side and it went backwards. Um, there has been a lot of, lots of exchanges. We have Jane House here, a translator, who did a lot uh, also in between their small festivals, but on that scale, really uh, nothing, and people in America thought perhaps there is nothing really happened after Pirandello. We all know it's not true. <laughs> Uh, you, you might all be laughing, but that is it. Often when I, we have international guests, they think nothing has happened after Tennessee Williams or Arthur Miller because <laughs> people don't know American writers also outside. But a lot have happened, has happened also here and is being shown and presented. So it's a big, big honor for us again to be involved in this project. It's been very successful, very significant. And someone in Italy told me, you know, it was La Mama that invited us all and had come, people come over. Now it's actually you guys. And I said, I don't think so. We are a small university, as you know, with a tiny staff. But still, it has a real significance. And one of, the, um, one of the manifestations is that we have a playwright with us here from Italy who flew in, arrived yesterday, Elisa. So baby, uh, say quick hello. So we really, really want to thank you for coming. She was part of the second uh, edition and is part uh, also of our uh, publication, which we celebrate to now. We will see that more. This book just came out, and um, we are very, very proud of this. We are one of the very few academic publishing houses that uh, do print plays from around the world, even so nobody buys them. Once they're out, there's a PDF online, and everything is gone, so uh, <laughs> it's no longer what it used to be. But we think it's significant, it's important that plays get printed, that they are there, but of course that they're also available and being sent around. We know that's the way how it is. But we take pride in that, and the Italian uh, uh, plays that we had here in this edition were very significant and um, had also, I think, a uh, big impact. The Lehman Trilogy, the book, at least it was done here at first. You know, we were really uh, 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 proud of that, and uh, many, many, uh, many uh, others. So uh, tonight we will hear a reading, full reading of the play as a celebration also of our. Um, Italian uh, playwright project. Again, we were thrilled that we got that big uh, recognition in Italy for the work. And we really would also like to thank uh, Graziano for coming over. Uh, again, he was here once or two times before. He's a great uh, worker of the theater, a producer in Italy, um, who started a theater in Rome that was very, very influential and now uh, is a, a writer, a critic and also sits on juries for panels. Also a filmmaker, he did Pina Bausch documentary, which we showed here, a very interesting one of Pina Bausch in Italy. So it's great uh, to welcome. You came today or yesterday? Yesterday. Yesterday, and we came together, so welcome and for, for taking uh, the time. So Ride Tre, where you are affiliated with, is also a media partner of us, so we thank uh, Ride Tre. But there's one partner uh, we really need to say, of course it's obvious, and people always think, you know, who helps us and who does it and this and that. But the Italian Cultural Institute in New York really has very early on a very strong and significant uh, support. We could not have done it um, without it. Giorgio Hans Ratten was there in the very beginning. And, um, and then uh, now we have with us uh, Paolo, Baglia, ba uh, Paolo uh, ba Baclera, did I say it right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, who is here with us, who is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, director, and uh, with him is uh, Marlina uh, Manarino, so thank you for both for coming, and they also really have continued uh, work, and if they would have been earlier here, they would have also supported us. I think they really have been enthusiastic supporters. We also had a reading, which we produced together at the Italian Cultural Institute, and I think it's an example how 
uh, institutions can work together, but they also really help us for support, for printing, for designing, for paying translators. And we really don't take it for granted because we work with a lot of uh, cultural institutes, but the Italian Cultural Institute really has made a significant uh, contribution. And one of the reasons that we have the books and that we have that support and that it became so successful is really also your contribution. So I would like to say thank you, but still also give back, word to back the word to Valeria who really came here with that idea. And you all know New York and the New York City landscape to come from the outside and say, I want to do readings, I want to bring plays over, I want to bring translators to the work, pay them. It's close to the impossible. Uh, it's work in the shadows, it's often not paid, and you need a vision, but you also need tenacity and you really of deep belief that is of significance, and I think Valeria really had that. And I also would really would like to say thank you in the name of the Siegel Theater Center, Credit Center CUNY, and also the city of New York, and the American theater landscape, which has noticed that there are plays uh, from Italy out there that are of significance, and it's really because of you, people think it's about institutions, which in a way is true, but still it's also about the people who make something happen. So I really would like to say our respect and um, I give you now the microphone. The last thing is if you have a cell phone, take it out. I'll do the same. And let me ring her off, volume off, sound off. Mine is the Siegel Center Bridges Academia and Professional Theater, International and American Theater. And of course an event like this is uh, right uh, in the middle. It shouldn't be longer than um, 80 minutes. The reading is about 30, 40 minutes, and it will be followed by uh, panel discussion. And then we will have a discussion with you or for questions. Uh, Graziano will uh, join us, and, um, and we will uh, talk a little bit about the current uh, situation in Italy. So again, really, thank you for coming. I know there were three emergency emails and uh, uh, phone calls and alerts not to go out tonight it's a terrible rain <laughs> or snow i didn't fully see it but thank you really for coming a lot of people didn't come who said they would come because of it so again thank you for um, your help and um, valeria oh, i am the the worst person to, to speak in public. So I, I love to be on the back backstage, so have, have patience <laughs> to listen to me. But uh, thank you to Frank and the Martin Siegel Theater Center. This is a, a project and mostly a challenge, a very big challenge. We in Italy say dal basso, we can say from the bottom, because uh, when uh, this project starts, uh, starts from zero, zero at all. Then uh, we started to, to, to a new dialogue, dialogue with the institution. And it, it is not easy to speak about contemporary culture, Italian contemporary culture. We have a, a lot of uh, uh, culture to speak about in Italy. So everybody is, uh, Right, in the right way, focused in uh, Leonardo, uh, Dante, and everything is uh, the best of our culture, of course. Uh, but uh, we have also a situation now, during this uh, time, that is uh, very important to be uh, well known outside Italy too. So it's a good uh, uh, point to start a dialogue. And I am here, and my dialogue start, uh, starts uh, here. So uh, the first person uh, was uh, Frank uh, to listen my <laughs> my uh, desire, so my target. And now after four years, uh, uh, this uh, little project that was started from zero is uh, little by little went uh, in other cities, in other countries. So we went in London, we went in uh, Chicago, we started a good dialogue with uh, uh, UPenn and then uh, NYU and then uh, uh, Muhlenberg College that uh, dedicate one semester to this project uh, for uh, the students. And, uh, and I'm so surprised but also a little bit confused but now uh, we are closing the second edition. So we translated eight uh, plays uh, with, uh, co involving uh, 10 uh, uh, authors. Uh, many translators. Uh, we had a lot of uh, to learn during these uh, four years. And uh, now uh, we are a little bit 
more than zero, a little bit, but uh, we have, uh, we have al also a lot of friends, uh, and this is uh, uh, a very warm uh, wrap for us. So this is uh, what I say, and I, I want to just to present uh, the, the, the actors now that uh, they will uh, uh, have the reading for, uh, the, they will uh, read for us uh, the Event Horizon by Elisa Casteri, translated by Adriana Rossetto. That she is one of our translators. She is not here today, but uh, she is here in the soul, and uh, directed by, by Marco Calvani. Uh, Event Horizon crew, please come. We will present it after the, in, during the panel. Okay. Translated by Adriano Rosetta. An empty room, a studio, no windows. On the left wall, there's a small sink and a kitchenette. On the right wall, the entrance door, no doorknob. No door On the front wall, there are many doors and cabinet doors in all shapes and colors. They hang crooked or straight in a confusing installation of exits. Only one door is properly functional, and that's the bathroom door. There's no furniture, none. The room will be furnished and modified throughout the play. <laughs> Olga paces around the room. She rubs her eyes, weeps, she's very upset. She tries to open the entry door, but no success. She goes into the bathroom, comes out, goes in, comes out. She keeps pacing. Where? I would like to know where. And how? How does this work? It's, it's really not possible. It's, it's incomprehensible. How did I get stuck in here? And, and why? Why? This room is empty. It wasn't empty. I know it. I know this room. Marco! Where are you? Are you hiding? Are you, are you making fun of me? This isn't funny. This, this can't happen. This, these sorts of things can't happen. This, this, this can't be true. Olga sits on the floor, facing the walls of the door. You know, once I read that you can understand if you're dreaming, I, I think you have to look and watch twice or, or in a row or, or read a sign twice in a row and the, the letters would be different or the hands wouldn't move and, because there's no time and space continuum in the world of dreams. But here I have no watch and, and, and not even a word to read. And, and, Maybe I could try flying or levitating. If I succeed, this, this would clearly be a dream. What am I doing? Of course, I'm not dreaming. Out! Okay, Olga. Relax. Okay, you came in from there. You will go out from there. Olga stands up and tries to open one of the strangest doors, the biggest one. It opens. She climbs up towards it and crawls in. She comes out of the bathroom door. How does this work? Do, do, do I really have to guess which one is the right door? Marco, please help me! She starts counting. <sighs> I need a counting rhyme, that's what I need, okay? One, two, three, four, five. Once I caught a fish alive. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Then I let it go again. Why did you let him go? Because he pinched my fingers though. Which finger did he bite? This little finger on the right. She goes out one of the doors. Look, I changed the light bulb. Olga, where the hell did you go? Olga comes back from the entrance door, and when she sees Marco, she runs towards him. The entrance door slams behind him. God, Marco, there you are, finally! Oh, shit, I let, I let the door slam. Listen, Marco, we're stuck. Okay, we're stuck in this place, and I'm doomed to go around in circles in rooms that are infinitely the same as this one. Hey, what's the matter? What do you mean? Stop making up these crazy stories. Look, I just changed the light bulb in the bathroom. Aren't you proud of me? I, 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 
I, I don't know how to tell you what I'm about to tell you. You're breaking up with me again? Look, I, I know you're going through a rough time, Olga, but this is not the way. Trust me, it's going to get better. L listen to me, okay? I am stuck in this room. We actually, we are now stuck here, and, and there's no way out. Okay? The, the entry door, it's not working. Well, of course it doesn't open. The doorknob fell off, but I promise I'll, I'll fix it. The knob is in the sink, so you can just put it back on any time and the door will open. <laughs> Look, I, I know this house is sad. You don't have to remind me, but I think it's great my grandmother left it to me. <laughs> it's my home, you know? My home. And yours. It's, it's our home. What's wrong? You want to leave? You, you don't understand. Okay, and that's fair because what's happening to me is absurd. I can't understand it myself. Those doors on the wall are some sort of passage. Like any door I open brings me right back here to the same room. Sit down. No. Please sit down on the chair. I know you hate this situation, but things will work out, I promise you. We'll fix everything. Marco, listen to me. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Olga. Happy birthday to you. Yay! From one of the doors, Julia and Franco, Olga's parents, enter with the cake top of the tin birthday candle. They sing with Marco. Julia sings with a feeble voice, and Franco snaps his finger to the beat. This isn't exactly easy for him. You're in double digits. You're a big girl now. Happy birthday, darling. Congrats! Marco, this is my mother. <laughs> Do you understand that this is impossible, right? I, I want it to be possible, but it's not. You look how young my parents are. What's impossible? Look, today is my birthday, and clearly I am not 10. <laughs> in a corner of the house, Olga's parents start arguing amongst themselves quite intensely. Yes, you are. And I want that cake. Is that chocolate? I hope there's not fruit in it. Can't you see that we're grown-ups? We're 30 years old, and that's my mother. I have breasts, your armpits have hair. Just come on, look. You know what, Olga? I don't know if I want to be your boyfriend anymore. You're so weird. Why do you say all these things? And then you don't even have titties. Instinctively, Olga touches her breast. Marco pushes her, and she falls. Olga, don't hurt yourself. We didn't know each other as kids. Do you remember? What's happening? What the hell is going on? The other kids are playing dodgeball. Come on, come on, come on, hurry up! Come on! Marco goes out, but Olga doesn't follow him. She turns to look at her parents. She starts off in their direction, but they squeeze closer together. Okay, don't freak out. You're 30 years old. Your mother went away when you were a young girl, and your dad is older than this. This is a dream, a nightmare, something. Okay, you have to focus. You have to figure out how you ended up here. Okay, what was I doing? Where was I? Um, what happened to this room? What twisted onto itself? What are these doors? Julia slaps Franco and goes into the bathroom. Daddy. Olga, go play with the other kids. Julia, we can't go on like this, pretending like nothing is happening. It's not good for Olga. It's not good for anybody. You need to understand what you want from life. I know very well what I want from life. No response from inside the bathroom. Olga goes to the kitchenette sink and leans on it with both hands. Sees the doorknob and picks it up. Sees the door, but the doorknob that Marco had fixed on the door before is still there. I tell this is how you leave. Hmm? Your mom always called me the worst of father. Sure, Dad. Yeah. Dad, are you OK? Olga. Oh, you're here. Ah, I'm good. Yes. Yeah, so you, you have to help me. I, I have a huge problem. I, I need to understand what's going on, and maybe you are the only one. Uh, it's, not, it's not as bad as you think. <laughs> you're gonna move to another city. You're gonna meet other people. You'll go to college. And as I remember, you're about to live one of the happiest times of your life. Not to say that the years here weren't amazing, but you know, your, your mother. You're going to go well. Well, uh, don't be scared. Be excited. Did you see these doors? <laughs>
Doors. I don't understand how, but. Doors. Sweetie, don't be scared of anything. Don't throw yourself towards solutions. Don't save time. Let me give you some advice. Waste time. <laughs> Waste as much time as you can. Don't, don't try to find the shortest way towards what you think is right. Don't try to find linear solutions. Explore. Go off the beaten path and ask yourself if there's something else you want. I'm not saying to put yourself in danger. But don't play it safe all the time. Well, don't play it safe either. I remember this conversation very well. And you know, I always have to be first. You know, I, I did nothing but be first my whole life. And look where I am now. Graduated first. I married first. <laughs> first one to have a kid. First one to turn out to be alone. Now, just a couple of days ago, I was thinking that the greatest measure of time is the set. You understand? It's a set. So I'm gonna try to be safe. Try to be safe. Yeah, and I have to go. Wait, Dad, I need to ask you something. But maybe if I say it in a crazier way, you'll answer. Where does time flow? Um, where in the water pipes, in the in the tension cables, in the in the cracks in between the hardwood floor? Is there a chance to catch it? And, and stop it, like being stuck in a hole with your whole life at your fingertips, but you, you can't do anything about it and you, and you don't know why? Olga, you have to go. If, if it's me who has to go, why are you leaving? Like, stop, Dad, just stop, try, try to help me. Just give me a hand, please. What's, what's happening to me? Olga, you're a big girl, Dad. Olga takes the cake. <laughs> Sticks her finger in it and tastes it, and then runs to spit it in the sink. Ugh! Gross. <laughs> well, it was a nine-year-old cake after all. <laughs> Marco enters. He's carrying the table. Do you like it? Did you win it at the dodgeball competition? No, I... They dumped it, but it's in perfect condition, <laughs> don't you think? Now, this is where I gave him a scared look and I asked him if he got it out of the dumpster. Did you take it out of a dumpster? Yeah, uh, but now I'll clean it. <laughs> I, I can't fake this. You don't remember it, right? Don't remember what? That a second ago we were celebrating my 10th birthday with my parents. You left to go play dodgeball, and now you're back with a table that you picked up from the dumpster? Well, okay, if you don't like the table, I can take it back. There's no need to say those things and, and get so upset. Oh, God! I I think I'm in a space-time loop, or if that's what you call it. Like, I'm, I'm using words that my dad, I overheard him saying like over the years when he was trying to teach me some very interesting things about physics. You, you saying happy birthday to me, and then you left, and my mom went away, and my dad gave me the speech he had prepared for when I went to college. Wait, your mom? Your mother. Help me! I can't get out of this! Hey, don't be like that, Olga. You're scaring me. Look, I, I, I like you a lot. But right now, you're a little out of your mind, and I don't think I can stand much more madness. You know, my family I know a... that very well, Marco. I'm sorry. That what do you mean, just... no? I've never told you anything about that. Of course you've told me. I'm pretty sure I haven't. Okay, we've been together for seven years. You must have found a moment to tell me in all of these years. Actually, we met two weeks ago. Listen, I'm sorry. I. I shouldn't have brought you this table. I knew that it was going to be too much too soon. And and if you really want to know, I, I didn't find it in the dumpster. I bought it for you because you told me the desk your dad sent you never arrived, and you didn't want to ask him for more money to buy another one since he's really busy. And the fact that the post office lost your desk would have hurt him. So I I just thought that this would be something nice to do. You know, I I like you, Olga, really. But I I'm sorry. You're right. Thank you. So much. I, I really love this desk. You can keep it. It's yours. Now, I, uh, I'm sorry, but I have to go. Olga starts eating the cake. I, I think
didn't go this way at that time. After he gave me the desk, he, he kissed me and he didn't leave. Oh my God. Oh, what if I'm, what if I'm changing things? What, what if I'm shuffling things in my life? What if I'm really traveling through time? Could it be that I just created a parallel life in which Marco isn't here anymore? I scared him away. I lost him. I always scare him. I always lose him. I always scare everybody away, but why do I even try? Olga seems disgusted by the cave, but keeps at it for a while. Eventually she gets up, opens one of the smallest cabinet drawers and puts the cake in there. Goes back to the table, rethinks it, and immediately goes back to the open the cabinet drawer, but the cake is no longer there. She opens it once again, but nothing is there. Julia appears from the bathroom door holding her phone in one hand and in the other a long phone cable that starts from who knows where. I'm sorry. I, I stopped talking because I heard the door slam and I thought Franco had come back. <sighs> but it must be my imagination because no one's here. Mom! Uh, what was I talking about? Uh -huh. Oh, right. Franco is really sad that I can't get pregnant. Well, of course I'm not happy about it, believe me, but I don't think it's a tragedy. <laughs> Sooner or later, it'll happen. Yeah. Of course it'll happen. Well, neither one of us have any major medical problems, so... Yeah, so now he thinks that's because I, I don't want to be a mother, that I've been taking the pill behind his back, and to be fair, I've always said it wasn't my thing. Mom! Mom, I'm here! Can't you see me? Look, you, you'll be able to have a daughter eventually. It, it, don't worry. Oh yeah, for sure. But you know how Franco is, don't you? He's got his own way of seeing things. The right time, the right way, the right measure. You left before I had my first period and I didn't know how to talk with dad about it when it happened. I had watched all those movies with those awkward dads and those sad scenes. Ah, if only a mother were here. And so I decided not to tell him. And I asked my friends for pads or I'd buy them with my allowance and hide them. And then one day, Five months after my first period, I stay in the couch. And he very calmly walked over to the cabinet door and gave me these bags and bags of pads. He was prepared. And he gave me this beautiful speech. Um, as only he knew how. And as he talked, I smiled. And I thought that those movies really sucked. And that I wouldn't miss you at all. But I missed you. Oh, well. God. Oh, I miss you. Well, you know, I love you too. I love you very much. But we're too far apart. You married that woman and I married Franco. Maybe we shouldn't have this touch. Yeah, we're back in town for Christmas and we're spending the holidays with my relatives. Will you be there? Of course you'll be there, but how can I? How can you ask me to meet you? Julia goes back to the bathroom. Olga covers her eyes with her hands, spins around a couple of times, and then walks tentatively toward the wall full of doors. When she touches the wall, she uncovers her eyes, takes a deep breath, and exits from the door she landed on. She and Marco re-enter from the main door. He's the one covering her eyes now. OK, don't cheat. I'm gonna uncover your eyes with my hands, but then keep them closed, okay? Okay. You'll open your eyes and you'll see a place you know already with a wall that makes you a little uneasy, actually. All right, let's just say it's a wall that you hate. Well, right now you know exactly where you are, but uh, I'm not really good at surprises, you know that, but I've been able to keep this secret and not tell you anything all this time. I know you hate secrets, but you won't hate this one. All right, I'm listening. Should I keep my eyes closed? <sighs> no. You can open them now. <laughs> what? You don't have anything to say? But my house would be completely empty if it wasn't for your desk and... Marco goes out the door and comes back with the love seat and a couple of boxes on top of it. <laughs> for the couch I bought you! I don't understand. Let's sit on the couch. Let's sit and then calm down or like let's hang out? What? Are you kidding? Huh? Uh, God, I guess I'm starting to worry. About what? About how you're doing? You know, in relation.
explanation to what happened. But I have to tell you something important, and I can't keep it to myself anymore. Well, let's not sit then. I got accepted to the PhD program in Paris. You're kidding! <laughs> no! Oh my god! <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, come on, Olga, let's, let's not do this. What do you mean, let's not do this? We said we weren't gonna, this wasn't gonna happen anymore. I mean, you know, I, I have a girlfriend, and now we're about to leave for Paris together. Olga attempts to open a door in the wall, but the door doesn't open. <laughs> she persists and tries to open another one. Nothing. She goes out the main door, slams it shut, and then she comes back and finds everything as she left it. What the hell are you doing? Marco, am I crazy? <laughs> yeah, a little. No, is this real? How many years have we known each other? <laughs> Why are we not together? Of course this is real. Yesterday we had lunch, today we're here. Tomorrow we could do anything. We've known each other for seven years, Olga. We, we tried to be in a relationship, but we couldn't make it happen. We, we tried all those years, then, I mean, I guess at a certain point I, I met Carla, and now you started to see this guy, Alessio? He's the first guy you told me about, so he must be important, I what think. What was Carla, Alessio, who are these people? Come on, Olga, you know these people. You know those doors on the wall? The doors you hate and tried to destroy so many times? Yeah, those are Carla's doors. I mean, I actually think she's a pretty good artist. Oh, shut up! Alessio was one of your dad's assistants at the university. Come on, you met him a few days after the funeral. <laughs> Who's on funeral? On the phone, I think. <laughs> Who's funeral? Your, your dad's funeral. I knew that me moving to Paris was going to crush you. It, it's been six weeks since your dad's passing, and I can't even imagine how lonely and desperate you must be feeling. And Maybe I'm very selfish to be asking you this, but could you try to just be happy for me? I mean, for once, separately from all of your pain? But I am happy for you, Marco, though. You see, I don't remember my father passing away. I saw him a few hours ago. Look, I think it's that day, that if on that day that he gave me the desk, I hadn't gone crazy, maybe now we'd be together. Maybe, maybe now things would be the way they are, wouldn't be the way they are. Maybe, <coughs> maybe my dad wouldn't be dead. This is all my fault. This is a weird game that I'm stuck in, this puzzle, it's a nightmare. Oh God. I fell in love with you on that day because you seemed a little crazy. You know what you need to No, I don't know. I, at this point, I don't know anything anymore. Oh, God. I, the only thing that I know is that I love you. You're my whole life, Marco. You're, you're my best friend. You're the one that takes care of me and the one I take care of. In Paris, I gave up that low-paid internship, internship because we were supposed to move there together. Okay, I, I'm really starting to worry now. You didn't give up that internship. You're doing it now. And you're not doing it well. You're doing it with a thousand leaves of absence and with very little motivation and no desire to enter the real estate market. And, and I get it, but it was your only opportunity at the time. And you're underpaid, yes, and that's why I took your things here to tell you that. Since I'm leaving, you can stay at my place. You can live here so that you don't have to pay your rent. Have, have you lost your memory, maybe? Or <laughs> were you in an accident? <laughs> did, did, did you fall? I mean, let, let's see, what, what happened? I mean, I assure you this is real. Marco, I'm very sorry. Listen to me. I will never love anyone as much as I love you, and you know it. But I, I had to give up on us, and you did too. I mean, you didn't want to be with me. You broke up with me a million times. We're not capable of being together. Maybe we should take a nap. Stay here. On the couch. I'll help you pull off the bed. I have a thousand things to take care of before I leave. I'll spend the night at Carla's place. Olga and Marco pull out the bed. <clears throat> then Olga lays down on the bed and closes her eyes. Marco turns off the lights and leaves. One of the doors on the wall opens and Franco comes.
comes out with the lamp. He plugs it in and turns it on and starts talking to his daughter even though she's asleep. of the things I, I couldn't tell you. Some of them I just didn't have the time to explain to you. Well, others I, I told them that you wanted to hear them. Or maybe you really needed to hear them. When I told your mother that I knew everything about the man she loved and that I wanted her to leave, she left. I thought that choosing would have helped me to maintain control. Said from the moment she went away, I understood I wouldn't be able to control anything anymore. And I, I prepared for some moments of your life and I prepared myself to go through them with you and everything went well. You wrote, you studied what you wanted, you graduated, and now you're ready to live this strange and <laughs> this strange world with all these grown-ups. And I too have moved on. And now I learned how to do things that I became myself again. I understood that if you build a wall around you, people really leave and that we're not always worth they're not we're not always worth the fight. And then yesterday I was walking to the university and I saw it. in the courtyard with a young man wearing a graduation hat, a man that still is that man. I suppose the man I sent her to when I asked her to leave, the man that won the love that, of your mother when I decided to lose it. He must have rushed to get it because he was waiting for it. He laughed and laughed and she was posing for a picture next to her son with a Prosecco bottle in her hand. And then, and then, and then, and then she saw me. Franklin? Julia? How you doing? I'm standing. Yeah, I'll raise it without your help. Well, I don't want to fight. <laughs> I just wanted to say hi. I saw you, and I thought that it was ridiculous not to say something. That's great. But don't ask me about old. Not a single day went by without me wanting to call her. But then days went by, and my, my life became something else. What do you want me to tell you? There, there, there's nothing I can say to make you believe that I really care. But I really... You have a son. You have raised a son. For all this time, for all this time, I thought I had basically forced you into motherhood, which I thought was what made our relationship explode. Instead, you had another kid. So it wasn't like you didn't want to become a mother. It's that... Franco. I'm going to be late for class. I want to see Olga. You're just saying that, just like that, just because you saw me. I have been wanting to call her for a long time. Oh, you're going to call me. All right, the whole number is still the same. Don't be mean. What, me? I'm not mean. Let's be clear, Julia. Olga is my daughter, not yours. Imagine a body, an object, a ball, a spike, something extremely dense with a gravitational force so strong that nothing can escape it, not even light. Your mother was always that to 
to me, but rather patiently seek lightly to him. He called the black holes inside of there. Everything that went in there has never come back. This is how black holes work. <laughs> they digest everything. They're called black because the lowest speed needed to escape them is greater than the speed of light. So light ceases its energy and gets swallowed in, and all that remains is darkness. This is us. We are her heir for all these years, and she celebrated with her family while she created a memory with them and it devastated me. And I too fell in that black hole in my shoes at home. <laughs> and I tripped and I fell. You forgive me, my dear. I can't do anything else but believe you. Franco goes out the door from which he had entered, and we hear a gunshot. <laughs> Old girl wakes Bobby. She goes to turn on the main light and opens one of the boxes that Marco brought with the couch. She, take out, she takes out some books, some papers, and a sweater. She takes an envelope, holds it in her hand, and brings it to her chest. Then she takes her phone and dials a number. Hi. Um, can I bother you for a second? I, I, I wanted to apologize for yesterday. I don't know what happened to me. I was confused, but, but now I seem to remember everything. My dad wrote me a letter before killing himself, and, he, and I called the university and asked to speak with someone who spent time with him, and they gave me the number of this guy, Alessio, the assistant, who told me a lot of things. So I showed him a passage from the letter that my dad left me, a passage I didn't understand. <laughs> Something about black holes, about space and time, about the space-time continuum, really, and and space and time together, and I got distracted a number of times, um, probably to, to, as a defense mechanism from all the darkness, keep me from the cliff, from the gloom. And then he talked about another color. Then he talked about white holes, and he said that sometimes, something about symmetry and, and hypothesis and theoretical objects, but basically, if I understand it correctly, white holes are the counterpart to black holes. And with white holes, everything can come out and nothing goes in. <laughs> and if they existed, we could think of one, a one directional way, a space-time tunnel that connects the extreme black to the extreme white of the universe, and that allows traveling through time. And you enter a region of space and, and you come out from the other, from a black hole into a white hole. And then I understood. Olga opens the door, finds Marco in front of her holding a phone to his ear. I was on my way here. My dad is a black hole that has digested me inside of him. <laughs> and my mother is a white hole that spat me out far away from her. I could travel through time. <laughs> I can't go to Paris with you. But maybe you can come with me. Marco and Olga exit through the door. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Olga. Happy birthday to you. Yay. Olga takes Marco's hand. She leads him into another door on the wall. Olga pushes Marco out from the door next to the one they entered. He grabs the chair. Olga goes out and enters from the entry door. <laughs> Look, I changed the light bulb. I just seem to buy the couch. Marco looks at the couch. Uh, wait a minute. From one of the doors on the wall, Franco comes in with a letter in his hands. And so this is how you leave. The moment has come for us to part ways. Sure that let's go. Please let me hear it again. No, no, Olga, let's go. It's too dangerous. Marco drags Olga out from yet another door. Franco goes into the bathroom. 
When Olga and Marco come back in, no one is home. Wait, it, it can't be. This, this can't exist. We're, we're dreaming, or maybe you dropped a pill in something we drank. What? Are you, you must be kidding. I mean, what should I know? Yeah, what is this? When did it all start? Is this what you do to yourself? Is, is this what you do to me? Is, is this what I feel for you? This scraping, this exhausting, maddening feeling. I mean, is this the love you want? Marco, look, it wasn't me. I'm not a witch doing and undoing things for my own <laughs> entertainment, flying around on a broom preparing magic potions. What is all this then? I don't know. Oh, you don't know? No. Well, I know. This is not the life that I want. You can always go down, but you can't always take me down with you. It's not a matter of pain, Olga. You're, you're really crazy. Margot kicks the couch and then goes out, slamming the entry door again. Olga makes the bed, folds it back into the couch. She turns off the lamp and puts the chair in front of the wall for doors. Cell phone rings. After a search, she answers it. Hello? She hangs up but keeps her eyes on the phone. The phone rings again. I hang up. You're calling again. What, what point of life are you calling me from and why now? My dad died six weeks ago, they say. I don't think I want to see you. No. But unfortunately, I can't always decide what I what to do and what not to do. Lately, my life, spaces, and times are very confused. Olga hangs up and tries to open one of the doors from the wall. She can't. She tries another one. Nothing. The phone starts to ring again, but she doesn't answer. She punches the doors, starts crying, faces around. She looks in the box again, takes out a bag, sunglasses, puts them on before going out from the entry door. She turns off the light. The phone stops ringing. While the scene is dark, the wall for doors is replaced with a similar wall, but without doors, except from the bathroom room. There are many boxes and luggages in the scene now. I'm sorry, just give me a second. The door doesn't work right. Marco turns on the light and comes in with Julia. Over the head. You're very sweet. Thank you so much for meeting me, for answering my call. Listen, to tell you the truth, I answered without knowing who was calling. Olga didn't have your phone number saved. <laughs> When she disappeared, she left her phone here, and every day I'd hope she'd call. I, I answered every single call. Well, thank you for listening. Um, is this my daughter's home? No, this is not Olga's home. I, I took her stuff here, but she disappeared over three weeks ago, and she hasn't paid rent in a couple months, so... I mean, you know what happened to her father. It devastated her. I know. She only had him. Uh, that's the reason I thought that now that he's gone, that. Maybe she could use my help. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't think that's how that works. Interchanging affections like that? I mean, you don't know the first thing about Olga. <laughs> well, tell me then, what's the first thing? No, I won't. Because of so many different and complex reasons involving Olga, her feelings, and mine. I mean, the reason I agreed to see you and made you come here is to see if you had anything to tell me or, or would like Olga to know for when she comes back. I saw Franco the day before he killed himself. He's always been a real professional when it came down to making me miserable. But I have to say that killing himself, <laughs> no, that takes the cake. There's nothing worse than that to make me feel horrible. And that's what he decided to do. Well, finally, I was able to find Olga's num number. I had to lie here and there, and it took me a while to call her, but I don't have any bad intention. I just want to help her. Look, I'm not insinuating that you have bad intentions. I'm just saying that, unfortunately, I can't decide for her. Are you her boyfriend? No, I'm not her boyfriend. OK. Let's do this. Tell her that I don't want to apologize. With her father, I, I, I didn't have a life I could call my own. I spoke with a voice that wasn't mine. I did things with a timing that wasn't mine. And in the end, it felt like I was forced into pretending every single day. Now, she was part of that whole setup. <laughs> Truly, I would have never left if Franco hadn't found out, or, or that's what I like to think. 
The day he told me he knew it all, I felt free. I felt like I had the, an opportunity to start over, and I took it. Yeah, I'll tell him that. No, I want you to tell her that she's not alone, that she has a brother and a mother, and that she can stay with us whenever she wants, that I'll give her everything she needs. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Why are you laughing? I want to tell you something about your daughter. All that Olga has ever done in her life was cultivating solitude, not because her father was absent or because she didn't find people that loved her dearly, like me, but because of the moment you left and never looked back, Olga was convinced that everybody would always abandon her. And you know something? She's right. You went away, her dad killed herself, I'm seeing someone else, and I'm about to leave for Paris. And... I can't deny 20 years of my life. I can't disown my family. I'd go crazy. I'm sad, of course, but I have no regrets. Okay. Okay. Just one last thing. Shouldn't we report that she's missing? Shouldn't they look for her? Marco's phone rings. Are you here? Perfect. Don't worry. I know Olga, she's okay. Marco opens the door and we see the top of a small wardrobe coming through the door. He pulls it in. Julia tries to help him. <laughs> Thank you, it's very heavy and I wouldn't have been able to move it myself. I think it's better if I go, my train leaves in a bit. Can I leave this letter here for you, for Olga? Of course, you can put it on the table. Julia pulls out a letter from her bag, puts it on the table, and leaves. Marco opens one of the boxes and starts to hang Olga's clothes in the wardrobe. Olga's phone rings. Hi. Yeah, Alessio. Uh, now nah, I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow morning. No news on, me, on my side, you? I don't remember if I told her when I was leaving, but I just had this idea that today was the day that she'd come back, but I don't know, you know? Yeah, we'll see. Thanks, thanks you too. Yeah, good luck to you too. Marco closes the wardrobe, do wardrobe doors. He crawls into the couch and falls asleep. Olga comes in from the entry door, sees him. She looks around and starts to hang her things in the wardrobe. Marco wakes up. <laughs> Olga! <laughs> Hi. Uh, it's, it's so great you're okay. Uh, I'm so happy you came back. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to wake you. Uh, no, I, you didn't wake me up. I, I, don't, I don't really sleep. I haven't been able to sleep properly since you left. I mean, do you know how much you got me worried? I just, I needed time. Well, mostly I just needed to stop using the word time. Um, I know uh, you don't owe me any apologies, but I, I can't pretend I, I wasn't, how can I say, distressed by your absence. I mean, you don't even take your phone with you. I didn't need it. Alessio's called every day. Your, your mother called too. There's nothing between me and Alessio, nor will, the, uh, nor will there ever be. Same for my mother. Yeah, I know. When do you leave? Tomorrow morning. Actually, I think it's today already. Uh, this house with no windows always gets me very confused about the time of day. Like these really decrease the amount of doors, too. Well, uh, put it this way, Carlo wanted them back. Things got a little complicated after you left. Hmm. I'm sorry. Or maybe not. Maybe I'm not sorry. I told her that I'd rather leave for Paris by myself now, and she got really mad. She's much stronger than you when she's upset. I noticed that when she broke all the doors that you weren't able to smash. <laughs> Maybe I'm starting to like her, this Carla. After I leave. Go, Marco. Go. You sure? You know, I've read a lot these days, and um, I learned something. At the threshold of a black hole, there's a surface limit, a surface, and a region of space, and it's called. There's a region of space-time continuum that separates the place where you can still see this phenomenon from the place where you can't anymore. It's called event horizon, and basically it's the edge of the universal ignore. So you have to stay in the horizon not to fall into the black hole. Really, like every other horizon, it cannot be reached. It gets farther the more you get closer to it. 
like the future. Well, we have time, Olga. Just take some time. Time doesn't exist. Maybe it never has. Well, what about us? We'll love each other without loving each other, without being together, without windows, without doors, without furniture, without past, without future. Love each other without anything. Okay, but promise me you won't fall into any black holes. <laughs> Or white holes, or yellow, or cobalt blue, or sienna. And don't you go out the main door. Go through the wardrobe, you'll travel much better. <sighs> memories are just memories. Desires are just desires. They're not real anymore. Or, well, or they're not real yet. Just remember that. Do it for me. Marco puts on his backpack, kisses her, and leaves. Olga sits on the couch. Julia and Franco comes out from the bathroom door and sit down with them. Marco comes in from the wardrobe door with the cake. There's just one slice left. He sits on the chair and eats it. Everyone looks straight ahead except for Olga who, look, who looks at them one by one. Then she smiles. End of play. And I hope you don't suffer too much from jet lag, both of you. You're yeah. with us, yeah? Okay. And um, we'll put uh, some chairs up here. So um, let's sit down. Okay. okay, we might need one more mic uh, <coughs> from Marco. So um, first of all, um, how, how did it feel uh, hearing your New York reading? <laughs> eh, scusate, io parlerò in italiano. Non so chi. We translate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You say, you do. No, scusa. <laughs> 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 Come on, you Come can on. do it. <laughs> She said, I don't speak so well Italian. <laughs> no, English. Okay. <laughs> okay. Eh, è, è, sempre molto, è sempre molto emozionante vedere il proprio testo in un'altra lingua. It is always emotionally very, um, very uh, turbulent and moving to hear your own work in a different language. E so è, è soprattutto molto emozionante vedere come, sono, come eh, scaturisce diverse emozioni a seconda della lingua. Yeah, so it's always uh, very moving to see you know, how emotions get transferred you know, in, the, in a different language and how, uh, how, I guess, how actors react to it. E quindi niente, sono, sono molto contenta, infatti voglio ringraziare gli attori e Marco che sono stati bravissimi. Um, tell us a little bit if the idea for the play. How, when, when did you have the idea for the idea? Allora, sono stata uh, ossessionata per un po' di anni dai buchi neri. I was obsessed for a while by black holes. E ho cercato di, di raccontare questa storia in molti altri modi. Uh, quindi, inizialmente, volevo che fosse un racconto. And I started to tell this uh, story for, in many ways. And uh, at the start, I thought it was a literary, literary. Uh, no, uh, 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 storytelling. 
e a un certo punto era diventata invece un, una graphic novel in cui un bambino aveva dei buchi sotto le scarpe che erano buchi neri. And at a certain point it became a, no, a graphic novel uh, where a kid had the black holes uh, in the shoes, in his shoes. E però niente riusciva a, a farmi raccontare la storia che volevo raccontare e mi tenevo lontana dal teatro perché mi faceva molto paura pensare di portarlo a teatro. But nothing was uh, close uh, of uh, the history I was uh, I, I wanted to tell so I also was uh, far from theater because I I was fair by theater. E, e poi invece a un certo punto ho avuto questa immagine delle, delle porte che erano appunto buchi neri e buchi bianchi attraverso i quali poter viaggiare nel tempo e ho capito che la forma che quella storia necessitava era il teatro. And then finally I had this vision about the doors that became black holes and white holes and I totally understood that uh, that was the way to tell my history by theater. E alla fine questa storia, io non so come si può tradurre, spero che si possa tradurre, è una specie di viaggio spazio-temporale attraverso il dolore di una persona. Uh, at the end, uh, what uh, I would uh, express in my story was uh, a, a, like a trip, uh, emotional uh, and... Uh, so time-space time time continuum space of an continuum in, uh, inside the sentiments and the, the suffering the suffering of this uh, person so black holes um, you are interested in the scientific way or do you see them as a sign what it represents or do you are you scientifically engaged in your work or, or eh, io ho una formazione scientifica e, e mi succede sempre che quando voglio raccontare una storia quando una cosa mi colpisce non riesco è come se l'avessi fisicamente dentro e uh, my background is uh, scientific so I have uh, uh, era? <laughs> è come se è come se le storie fisicamente mi fossero ah. dentro so uh, it's like um, uh, the, the stories I have to tell uh, inhabit me e succede sempre che eh, per il mio libro no, beh, non ci allarghiamo se no dico cose che non so, valvola di ritegno forse Vabbè, eh. diciamo Vabbè. succede che eh, leggo qualcosa mi viene un, un, uno studio qualcosa e, e trovo la, la finestra che si apre per far uscire quella storia è, ha sempre un vetro scientifico So there is a, always a scientific mirror in uh, everything I, I think and everything I want to describe in my history. So, so also when I write a book, uh, uh, embrace shit, by books more than, uh, <laughs> than uh, playwriting, um, more than plays. Huh? And uh, something open, like a window, uh, and uh, in a scientific way. Scientific way. Thank you. So I would like to ask uh, 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 Marco, um, as he talked about his time, space, travel, and time, there was some time since she wrote it and traveled over here. <laughs> What did you, uh, out of that black hole, how did you manage it? How does it feel for you, the energy, the horizon that you'll never touch? Uh, how did you feel you touched something in the play? Did it touch you? Uh, I don't have a scientific background at all. Um, I. For me, the play was really about uh, the pain of this woman who has been abandoned twice uh, by her mother and by her father in both traumatic ways. So it, it was about a person who really was suffering and she was dealing in a, not in a uh, linear way, um, With, this, with her suffering. And so it, the story of a woman actually between sickness and suffering. I, I thought that the, the border was really thin. Um, I thought that the black holes and the white holes was a great uh, sort of more of a vision than an image. Um, um, 
for to explain the trajectory of the character. Uh, I certainly connected. I connected very well and very much with the with the pain of the abandon, mm -hmm. uh, to which, in some degrees, I feel that every one of each one of us has dealt somehow in his own life. Mm -hmm. Like so. Um, yeah, I can't explain black holes and white holes. If that's what you're asking me, I don't know. <laughs> but do you, uh, one second, do you, um, do you, um, what was difficult? Was there something you felt, it comes from, you know, Europe, these are messages are from Italy. Was there something difficult where you felt like, how do I do that best? Or did you feel it had kind of a universal? No, I certainly felt it was universal. Uh, there's a way of looking at things and translating them into stories that certainly European, I can I can't even explain it, uh, <clears throat> and that probably it becomes a genre, uh, but that's also what you're interested in doing here as a Martin Siegel. But in terms of the theme, I totally think that's universal. And Elisa Elisa writes in a way that's so, if you'll allow me to say that, so unspecific that it becomes very much specific, very much universal. So we don't, the only Italian, I feel that the only Italian um, reference are really the names of the characters. The rest could be, and maybe Paris, that sounds so close to where they actually are, but you don't say anything about the cities, you don't say even anything about the PhD or what they study, you know, it's, it's very open and universal, and that's, that's a gift, you know, if you want to do it in New York, for example. Thank you. Um, Graziano, you have um, been part of the Italian theater scene. You formed it and observe it now. You write about it. Where does her work fit in into the Italian contemporary scene of playwriting, La Dramaturgia Italiana? I try <coughs> to answer in English. Um, yeah, uh, it's a, a little bit uh, not, um, I, I don't think it's a typical uh, writing. The Elisa's writing because uh, she came back from she she's a writer she write novel basically and this uh, this one it was the first thing you wrote for theater or the second one the second one and uh, with this second mm, you know shot she won the the, the most important prize uh, Premio Riccione in 2015 and I was in the jury and I I re clearly remember that we are talking about the, the play. That convinced all of us. We were ten in the jury, and uh, but we were discussing a lot because we were feeling something different. At the, at the beginning, we were scared because we say, "Okay, this is science fiction. It, it, it cannot work on the stage." This is the first impression. No, it cannot work. It's too, you know, fantasy. Because our scene normally is very, very, very uh, realistic or symbolic, but you know, uh, talking about uh, language, not talking about uh, what what um, the situation. So uh, at the beginning, we were like um, with no orientation in uh, you know exploring the play, but every one of us was convinced that it was the best we read at that point. So we start to look at the play in a different way and to understand that this scientific background is a kind of symbol, it's a kind of, uh, you know, uh, weapon she used uh, to explain what is the suffering of the people, that is totally a normal way to, you know, uh, to, to feel about the story, to, to look at the story of the character. Uh, I mean, 90, 95% of people in Italy that work in theater, even in literature, has a humanistic background, as Marco <laughs> say, you know? Uh, they don't know, everybody of us know, um, you know, very few things about science. So when you have a writer that knows something about science, you can feel it, and you feel something different than what we like about the play. Uh, I think she connected uh, with a strong tradition we have in Italy. We have a very strong writer that have a scientific background. Uh, Gadda, first of all, but even Primo Levi that we you know, celebrate uh, the century of the birth of Primo Levi just this year. And it is very important for us because it, uh, you know, it's our right that tell about Shoah that came back from Auschwitz and try uh, 
not only the memory but even the language to say that one. And I think that mm, you know the, this writer that have so uh, you know few few guys in the in panorama and the landscape of writing in Italy that have a scientific background, they do a special work with language. They are very, you know, we, we, we love to use words, sometimes too much. This writer that with a scientific background, they are specific. They find a word, they use the word, and that's it. And that's why we uh, give the award uh, to, this, to this play. Did you see the Italian production? Or? No, they, they didn't. Uh, they are still <laughs> doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She has a she has a problem with the with the first production that failed, and then now there's another production that they coming to. I think in two th in 2020. No, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Let's see. He got a, a little problem with the with the production, but uh, you know they, they, they start a new one with a very interesting uh, female director. Uh, you, you have not a female word to say director. No, yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, that actually she, uh, Georgina Pisci, work a lot with uh, English literature. Uh, now she's working with uh, K, Temp K, K Tempest and... Uh, Carrie Church. Carrie Church, of course. She work a lot with Carrie Church. And I think it's, you know, even this point of view uh, is interesting because uh, uh, in a way, I mean, uh, Elisa Cassidy, it's a uh, part of our, you know, landscape, but in a way she's different. And I think this point of view, you know, from a director that works a lot, especially with English plays, could be, could, could be a match. Yeah, thank you. I think also it's a very innovative, it's precise, but still very, very open. And I think to draw the analogy to science, I mean, Bertolt Brecht wrote about the science of theater. He actually did say theater is a science. You can study it has laws, but as scientific. As chemistry, like a primo libre. Yeah. We all think it might be true, it might not be true. Um, think, uh, Will Eno famously said, um, I hope it's not the same because if I have a scientist, they should have the very same exact measurements and results. It doesn't matter whether you're from China, from Mongolia, from Germany, or whatever, but if you're an artist, we want to know where you're from. How do you see the world? What is a different approach? And it should be different, but the combination of both, and that's what it is, it's just a very beautiful, rare approach, and I think it's a great credit to Italian writing, this kind of formal innovation of, a, of a, a poetic, uh, a sparse uh, uh, approach, almost, almost like the table of periodic table, you know, the yeah, land where you lined up things. But I also, for you, have you, how do you see her work in Italian uh, contemporary landscape? You produce a lot in Italy. Yeah. I, 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 I want to thank, thank the actor, first of all, uh, because, <laughs> because I, 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 I want to really thank uh, Alison, Teresa, Robert, uh, sorry. So let's have a big applause. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, uh, I have a long journey today. Marco, that is also a friend, but I want to thanks because uh, it's not an easy uh, reading, and um, and uh, of course uh, it, it is a lot for us also to have uh, their efforts, and, uh, and this is uh, my production vision also. I want to thanks uh, first of all uh, everybody who works uh, in the theater environment because without them, my work doesn't mean nothing. Mm. So, <laughs> these, uh, uh, and, and this is connected also with your question. How do we, I feel that the Italian, uh, so, I have to say that I live in uh, New York six years now. So I, I miss uh, a lot. I, I miss uh, in the sense of, of I don't see. And, uh, and, uh, I left Italy while uh, everything was uh, changing very, very fast. And uh, now I think uh, something is uh, almost changed. Maybe, yeah. uh, also seeing, uh, for example, the Ubu Prize uh, a, a couple of days ago, two days ago. Uh, Graziano from the Ubu Prize, uh, from the radio came to, uh, <laughs> to New York in person. I was uh, shocked, you know. <laughs> because it was pre presenting the Uber Prize, but also seeing that the, uh, the China prizes, 
and the Istrio project. Uh, we have uh, something that is moving uh, in the background. So dramaturgy and research uh, goes together. Uh, we have uh, some uh, in, in interesting spots uh, in directions. Look by far from here. So Georgina uh, Pirozzi, Georgina P is one of them. It's very, very interesting for, uh, for me to see how she is uh, uh, working on the uh, international uh, dramaturgy um, and with, her, uh, they, uh, with the actors uh, that she has around, uh, the very professionals. So we have, um, you know, when, uh, when something is changing, uh, in my uh, position you can see a little bit uh, in advance what happened in the future. So when I decided to leave, uh, I saw a gap in the future. And there was a gap because uh, we had uh, for four years uh, a big gap in theater in Italy. Mm. Now, after this gap, I see something is a little by little going, 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 going up. up. Graziano? I don't, I don't know, yeah. maybe Graziano can... Can you can say a little bit, <coughs> so uh, also beyond the play, about the contemporary scene of the last two, three years, what's happening on Italian stages, if you can say, what do you detect, what are changes from before? Yeah, I, I'm agree with um, Valeria, just asking if uh, this changing has happened because some guys has died and some places are <laughs> free, <laughs> because, you know, we have a not a strong tradition of renovating uh, places we, like Africa. <laughs> no, no, no. Franco oh, no, Quadri. No, 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 no. Franco Quadri was, a, you know, a very <laughs> peculiar guy, but yes. it was very good one. Now, I mean, uh, pe people in charge uh, in the public theaters, but yeah. sometimes they stay there for forty years, as a little bit, a little bit too much. Uh, well, I think that uh, now we start to have um, a contemporary tradition of uh, dramaturgy that we lost a little bit after the 80s, because the last uh, big writer uh, in, in Italy was Eduardo from Napoli tradition. He was connected with a, you know, a peculiar kind of theater because he start from, it came from a vernacular, you say vernacular, uh, theater from Napoli, that it's, uh, you know, it's a strong tradition. And it came universal in a way, but he died in 84, I think, and uh, that's, that's all. After that, we have uh, for 30 years, like, uh, you know, like two words, you know, the big, the main production about Shakespeare, Ibsen, Pirandello, of course, and the uh, research theater, experimental theater, it was just rejecting, rejecting the um, new writers, the dramaturgy. So the writers doesn't know uh, where to go. Uh, in the last 15 years, I think it was a connection between the writers and the experimental theater, that it, it, it's not more such experimental, I think, but uh, this marriage uh, started to, to give, uh, you know, uh, some, some fruits, some new burn, you know, uh, kind of artist. And uh, I think that uh, we start to have, you know, a, a good tradition in the last 10 years, especially, uh, of uh, writers. Uh, some of them, you know, of, of course, you know, because uh, uh, Fausto Paramedino, Lucia Calamaro are one of the most well known. And uh, we have, uh, you know, we have a, a weak project about publishing theater. And now, one uh, of the most important, I mean, the most important uh, editor, pu publishing house, publishing house is uh, Einaudi. Uh, start to mm, publish Lucia Calamaro, of course, Paravidino, all these, you know, most known, uh, Davide Carnevali, it's another guy, that, uh, uh, Stefano Massini, of, of course. And um, so we are searching for a different public. Ten years ago, this guy was known just for, by the audience that goes to theater. Now there's uh, another kind of audience for this kind of theater. It's more, mm, you know, coming from, uh, all the citizenship, I mean, people that fear, follow cinema or just people that... Writing poems. I credo che sia la storia che ti chiede che tipo di, di mezzo di utilizzare. So it is uh, the story that asks you what kind of uh, uh, path you need to use. 
per, per quanto riguarda la mia visione del teatro, eh, io mi sono resa conto che eh, uso il teatro quando voglio rappresentare quello che succede all'interno della testa di una persona. Uh, in, uh, in my choice, theater was uh, the, um, the part I choose uh, to explain what happened inside the mind and the soul of a person. So che sembra un paradosso perché in realtà il teatro è quando tu metti invece in scena le persone e non, no? La letteratura è molto più mentale. It could be uh, in appearance a, a paradox because uh, uh, theater shows uh, the external way of, uh, uh, of uh, the life of a person and literature is mostly an introspective way. Mm -hmm. E invece per quanto mi riguarda è come se riuscissi attraverso eh, queste persone vive sulla scena a rappresentare qualcosa di estremamente interno. Nel uh, in, in mio caso ho bisogno di queste live persone sulla the stage per uh, rappresentare quello che vivo inside la mia mente. Wonderful. Let's uh, I think it was we really did see real people and uh, talking together, but we also had voices. I think from your mind or from, from the universe and black holes. So maybe uh, Michael, if you can help us put some light up uh, on the audience, we take a couple of questions. Yeah. It was such an interesting, good discussion. We went a little bit, you know, almost close to time. And um, so, um, so whoever um, has a question, maybe you, you let us know, but maybe one of the actors, would you, if someone want to say a few words yeah. of uh, how it felt or um, to, to, to speak uh, that <laughs> A little research on the, the black holes and, and uh, uh, watched a documentary, part of a documentary on Netflix. And <laughs> I'm not scientific as you are, Marco, as you say, but the stars that destroy, I mean, they, they kind of end, create black holes, what I understand. So for me as an actor, I connect with, for instance, people in, in our lives that that pass away and, or they take actions and, and they do things such as that and they create, I know my sister, she lost a, my nephew to substance abuse and it's created something in, inside of her that there's an emptiness. Um, so, I mean, but it doesn't go away. I mean, the, the memories remain. And then I was watching Stephen Hawking and he was talking about the hairs the event horizon, that although things get sucked into the black holes, they still don't ever go away, that they remain on the edges. So it was just abstract and interesting that, you know, people in our lives, especially Olga, the people who left, uh, her mom left, created this, and perhaps in my life, prior to something happened, Um, as Franco, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just an interesting the whole theory of how you rel I can relate to that as an actor, as a human. Um, for me, it, it was um, really interesting to connect with her journey from the, the franticness of not knowing and not understanding uh, the things that have happened to her, and um, we talked about her being in her head a lot and trying to comprehend feeling can be really challenging. And then it was that journey until the resolve of, at the end, they're all still with her, even though everyone has left her. Um, and it's like coming to terms with that. But it was just, it was a really powerful journey of, of that for, for me. And then to, to understand the connections with her parents, as well as, as with Marco, and, and how that shapes who she is. And, and that, relating that to the time-space continuum, which is such a beautiful, And, and poetic way of doing it, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, anybody uh, has a question or comment? I can give you the mic, not only so we hear you better, but it's also live speaking. How uh, internationally we um, My question is uh, uh, most of the writers, they write something from their life. So, these characters, uh, how much is uh, from your life and how much is uh, imagination? Um, 
io principalmente sono una scrittrice di fiction, quindi in realtà non c'è mai niente che viene dalla mia vita. Uh, in my life I have uh, I, I, I write fiction, so anything uh, is uh, outside my life. Però in realtà non c'è niente nella fiction che non faccia parte della tua vita. But in, so, but in the same in the same time there is uh, everything in the fiction that is part of my life. E quindi la fiction diventa la maniera in cui uh, filtri tutto quello che non solo hai provato tu, ma che hai sentito che gli altri provavano. So is a uh, is like a melting pot filter that uh, report uh, what I feel and what I think the other people feel. Io, io credo che la scrittura abbia a che fare con uh, un profondo sentimento di, di empatia e sensibilità che fa sì che lo scrittore è come una spugna. Uh, in my role of a, a writer I try to be a sponge to attract and re and uh, ridare uh, and yeah, give back uh, while I, I, I write what I feel from the outside. E, e quindi come succede spesso agli scrittori scrivi qualcosa che poi ti succede. So as a usual happens to the writers uh, you uh, write and then after something happens. Non so, prebiografia, prefiction, non so come si può chiamare. It's like, uh, it's like to read in the future. <laughs> okay. ok. Another question, also comment. Um. No, I, I, I I, so I'm going to mumble on here, I think, a little bit. But my thought is, first of all, I, I loved um, the idea of the, do the doors opening. Just I found, found it would be a very interesting play to, to direct and to try to figure out the doors and the movement of the furniture. I, I think it's very theatrical and that's, that's important. And I loved what you did with just turning the, the, just turning the music stand. I thought that was very effective. Um, somehow or other, I, I find there's, you mentioned this Lucia Calamaro, and as you know, <laughs> I was very involved with the translation of that. And it's wonderful to see um, female writers using science, and of course Lucia goes into great depth about all kinds of, of psychology and um, many, many aspects of, of thought. And I just really found it very interesting that you, as a female writer, were using these scientific images, and I wish that we would see more of that in, in writing today. Wonderful, thank you, Jane. Uh, maybe Marco has a question. Do you, could you see this on the stage, on a New York stage, or would you, Derek, Derek, could you think, could you see this directed on stage? Would New York audiences come? I, Can I you take your mic, Ed? Yeah. <laughs> I would see more, more directly on stage than for a reading. It was very hard. Was very a, hard, yes, yeah. yeah. You did uh, quite uh, yeah. It's full, as it should be, full of stage directions and all these doors came in. I mean, the different, many different kind of doors, they all got kind of in and out. It was like, so, but to make it interesting and fluid for you, tonight I had, we had to make a, so we had to make a selection and, and also, no, I mean, for us, Really, the point was to go to the essence of the play, to the essence of the characters, to the theme, to go straight to the core of the play. And so I think it would be extremely fun, as, as you just said, to, to stage it. Yeah, totally. I mean, you, you will, uh, I think, Robert, today, today, because we just rehearsed a bunch of hours today, and, uh, and he, he said, oh, this play is like, it's like a jazz session. And it's true, it's written sort of that way, because it's sort of a dance, but it's, a, it's an unpredictable dance. And um, as probably is in, in the space, you know, in the universe, it's like very unpredictable what, happen, what happens there. And so these doors, and so the movement, the coming back and forth in time and space, yes, I, I would see that. I, as I said before, it's very universal, and it can totally work here, I guess. Thank you. Maybe one more, yeah. 
I would like to uh, agree with Marco, because while I was listening to it, I was thinking how wonderful it would be on the stage, because I also read a lot of um, science books, even though I'm not a scientist, but a writer. And I wrote myself a play about, not about personal things, but about something else that has to deal with physics. And I think that more I read about physics, the more I, I feel that the analogy between feelings and unconscious and memory and time in the laws of physics are so s s the same as our own inner beings and our structure as people, as human beings. I mean, there is an, a complete allegory, not, not even an allegory, a, a, sim a similarity, an analogy that is similar. I don't know if you think that, but I feel that on the stage it would be great. Yeah. <laughs> really, too. <laughs> we do, we wait. So uh, we're a little bit over time, and we're going to have a reception here. I think the uh, Italian Playwrights Project also did a little uh, magic trick and brought a gigantic panettone and a uh, yeah. little bit of spumante for us for thanking you yeah, thanks for to coming Bindi out. Because uh, we really have a friend uh, that is uh, Bindi that uh, uh, gives us a panettone, yeah. a real panettone. <laughs> but, uh, so, so this is uh, holidays. Uh, uh, yeah, so as a reward for fighting the big snowstorm. <laughs> but before we come to an end, uh, maybe let us know. Uh, what are you working on on a novel, but also as a play, if you want to share, what, what are the projects you are working on right now? Okay. Um, innanzitutto volevo dire, volevo dire all'ultima all signora che ha parlato che anche le altre cose che faccio sono basate su un'analogia tra scienza e letteratura. Everything I wrote is... Uh, yeah, but the ah, audience no. not. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, me too, I am Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can listen, I am Italian. Um, uh, so every, everything I wrote, I write, is uh, uh, connected uh, between uh, science and... Uh, I, I, I would like to, mm, to ask to Elisa to, to tell to the audience the title of your opera, I mean, of your novel and of your uh, plays, because the title says everything. Uh, my first book, uh, Teoria Idraulica delle Famiglie. Hydraulic Theory of the Families. The first book. Uh, the, the second, La Botanica delle Bugie. And the second is uh, The Botanic of Lies. Um, L'Orizzonte degli Eventi fa parte di una trilogia antologica. Uh, Event Horizon is a part of a trilogy, uh, anthologic trilogy. Uh, il primo testo uh, si chiama teore La teoria dei giochi. The first uh, play is uh, The Theory of the Plays, Ispir of the Games. Of the game. Ispirata of the game. alla teoria dei giochi di John Nash. Inspired by uh, John Nash. Poi l'orizzonte degli eventi sui buchi neri. E poi la terza, mi dispiace. Event Horizon on, uh, about the, the block, black holes. And then the la terza third. si chiama Il polo dell'inaccessibilità. <laughs> Il polo dell'inaccessibilità. Dell polo, oh. no, polo, 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 polo is the chicken? No, polo is the pole. Pole, yeah. Oh, the pole. Okay. I'm glad we have real translators. Allora, è un punto statistico. Is a point, a statistic point. Che è in mezzo all'oceano Atlantico. It is in the middle of a, a Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean. Ocean. E che è um, il punto più lontano da tutte le terre emerse. That is the farthest point of uh, every... Uh, From every, every land. Every land, yes. E quindi se una nave passa sopra quel punto è più vicina alla, spa alla stazione spaziale internazionale che a qualsiasi altra cosa. So if a, a ship uh, goes uh, past on this uh, point, it uh, must be closer to the... Uh, what? International Space International Station. International Space Shipper than... Uh, to the land. E, e questo testo è uh, un testo che uh, parla di energia oscura e materia oscura. So is, uh, this uh, play is uh, about uh, uh, dark, dark matter energy and dark matter. Dark matter. E, um, perché parla così di una geografia astronomica, una geografia terrestre e una geografia emotiva. Uh, speaking about uh, geography in uh, a lot of sense. 
astronomica, uh, terrestre, terrestre, oh, earthly, earthly, and uh, sentimental. Uh, I want to say just another thing, very slowly, to one about uh, you know a scientific background, because uh, at the beginning I say uh, scientific people with scientific background, they use language in a very you know, specific way, but it was, uh, in, it's interesting, as you say, that uh, scientific background can be, uh, you know, a starting point to talk about emotion. It's more and more like this, and uh, it's happening when, uh, you know, we have a tradition of uh, um, writers with scientific background that they are all male, and now, in this, last year uh, the scientific writers are uh, female because uh, there's a, for example Chiara Valeri that is a novelist, uh, Elisa Gasseri is a novelist and playwright and uh, I think something changing a little bit even from this point of view and uh, it's a, it, it just, you know, female writers with background, um, uh, scientific background it's a kind of new thing in Italy uh, as like, uh, you know, in the uh, Ubu Award uh, yesterday, we have the second uh, direct female director winning the prize for, uh, uh, for direction uh, in uh, 42 years. <laughs> I don't know what... Have, it's about what, time. Yeah, it's about time. So I think this is another thing we have to say about uh, the writing of uh, Elisa Cass. And, and then maybe it's not the Ferrante. Ferrante. No, but it's a very nice thing. What are you, what's Ferrante your next effect. play? <laughs> what, is your, uh, what is your next theater play you're working on? Do you have one you're thinking about? Uh, una protesto. Mm -hmm. What are you working on at the moment? Per ora no, perché ho appena fatto un lavoro su il delitto del Circeo, che è un delitto molto famoso in Italia. Uh, at the time not, because I just uh, finished a work uh, about uh, uh, the murder of uh, Ciceo. This is a very uh, tough story of uh, uh, the um, uh, crime in Italy. E sto scrivendo due libri nuovi. And uh, I am uh, also writing two new books. E una serie televisiva. And one uh, TV show. Well, I'm glad you had time to come to New York City. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. So, thank you so much uh, for coming. Thanks to Marco and the actors. Graziano from Miami to tell us about my superheroes. Thank you. And join us all for the reception. I'll stay here. the books from the uh, Italian uh, Playwrights Factory in the second edition out for a special price, $10 instead of $30.
cioè, se me l'avesse chiesto infatti io per poco il viperito ho visto che però fa parte di questa cosa fa parte del mio caro so everybody have a drink have a piece of cake questa predisposizione che è successo questo è il caso ma scusami ma io voglio No, ma fate gli